But do you correlate, Richard, I'm sorry, do you correlate that to the Southern Cross alignment of the galactic center in the solar system? Well, the Southern Cross is one indicator you can use. You can use Scorpio. You can use, you know, it, it, we basically are looking at an alignment on December 21, 2012, which is the solstice alignment. But we've actually been in this alignment since 1998 with the sun crossing the galactic plane a little bit further every year for something like 25, 30 years. I forget what the actual window is. What's missing in the other models and which is present in our model is that this physics, this cycle is being driven by other solar system objects that are tethered to the sun by gravity that are very far out there, hundreds of astronomical units that are not visible yet, although maybe the wise NASA missions have actually found evidence of, of, a, of a big planet or a small brown dwarf or something way out there, maybe called Tyche, as one of the models claims that they've got data. The point is that none of this stuff is going to intrude or enter into the inner solar system. So all the fear-mongering and fear-porn models of life, of the end of life on Earth and all that, because of Nibiru or the Black Dwarf, is just total nonsense. However, okay. Richard, what, 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 you can modulate the physics using one of these objects is in fact what we think is going on, and as soon as NASA releases the wise data, we'll be able to plug those numbers into the model, and then we'll see. Okay, this, this is, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to step on anyone's toes. I, but I, you brought up a good point because uh, fear porn and the thought of impending doom from Nibiru slash Brown Dwarf Star is also uh, a part of why this panel was put together. Now, we were going to have Terrell, uh, who is probably most famous for bringing this theory to light, uh, and he was around at the beginning of the show, but he didn't stick around because I had to get some of the other callers going. But tonight we have Envy Life 904. Envy Life 904 had a connection with Terrell at the very beginning. And I'm going to go ahead and ask Envy if you'll give us a five to ten minute summary up until the end of the hour. We're going to go to, till 9, 9 p.m. Eastern time about what you've experienced through the beginning and the end of this comet Elenin. Okay, yeah. Well, first I'll elaborate. I just want to coincide with some of what uh, Mr. Hogan was saying about, um, you know, releasing the wise data, which mysteriously got shut down. That's important, and I've been waiting for that data to come, you know, to light. And, you know, I've pretty much been following the Planet X, uh, Nibiru type stuff for about five years now. And, you know, over the years you, you get to learn and you dismiss certain things. And anyhow, to, to elaborate a little bit more on, on, on your what you brought up, Francis, is, you know, early on this year, uh, January, I was uh, taking part in Afro Patriots' uh, um, research room, and we were talking uh, privately on, um, uh, you know, via uh, YouTube, and then we started, he started a chat room on Pal Talk, and then um, we started elaborating on what, what, what could be going on, and, and the different people got together and were trying to figure it out, and uh, what, what seems to be going on is that, there's no possible way that Ellen could be a brown dwarf star because it, it's just anybody could do their own homework and see that it's, it's totally impossible. Uh, it can, it, it's no possible way it could be a neutron star. And with, with what my point is is that we possibly are living in a binary star system because 80, 80 to 85 percent of the stars in our solar system are binary. So the likelihood of our star, our sun, being binary is very likely. Okay. And uh, Envy, did Terrell have you believing it was a brown dwarf star? Yes, Terrell did have me believing it was a brown dwarf star. After Astro Patriot had some personal issues, he, dispar he departed from the group for a while, and so Terrell, uh, like he says, he got pushed to the head of the class, as he says. But he did have me believing it was a brown dwarf star for a couple months, and you know, he has he had his theory, but it you know it takes some time to be able to go through all the information that he was putting out there to, to be able to disprove him and prove him wrong and that's pretty much where we're at as far as the comparison of uh, Terrell's theory and, and factual information at this point. So what, what basically happened is as you're doing your personal research you're introduced to the theory you are told the theory by someone like Terrell who speaks it very well and seems to have researched a long time but through your own research you've, you've proven to yourself that Terrell is incorrect right and on top of that you've kind of proven to yourself that Terrell doesn't really care about the truth right absolutely I, I can concur with that 100% that 
it's that's the, the question I actually asked Mr. Musgrave is can, can for instance can Ellen the comet can it be visible and when did the window for being able to view it when did that close the reason I asked him that that particular question is just to prove to back up multiple multiple things as far as when when the, the window actually closed for viewing it from uh, Victoria Australia and okay, he obviously but, said, you know, early September, weather right. coming. Yeah, Terrell has stuck by his guns the whole time, but uh, between you and me, we both proved to ourselves something different's going on. Right now, we're going to take a moment. Nighthawk's going to play a station break, everyone. If we hold on for a couple of minutes, we're going to jump right back into the discussion. Remember, while you're listening to the station break, to click on the donate button in the left-hand sidebar. Give us a dollar. Give us what you can, because if you don't give us something, we won't be here. Hey, Tim, what do you got to say? Welcome to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. We are 100% listener supported. Right on. Do we got a chat room? Yes, we do, and it's full of information from people tonight, like Richard C. Hoagland, Ian Musgrave, Francis Walsh, that's me, Terrell Croft, that's him, and a couple of guys you probably know, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. So join us in that chat room at freedomslips.com and enjoy yourself this evening. Remember, we are 100% listeners supported. Uh yes, listeners, <laughs> listeners I, I need to speak to the listeners for a second. It's important. You've all come to hear the truth about what's going on out in space. Without places like Revolution Radio, you wouldn't be able to listen to me and my other guests tonight. We work extremely hard to bring the real information to you. Honestly, it may be a lot of different viewpoints, but each person is speaking from the heart. It is your chance, your time, to show support to the radio station by clicking on the donate button. This is me, Francis, asking you to leave a little donation for tonight's show because it's that good and it's that worth it. Freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio, 100% listener supported. Like Francis said, join us tonight. Listen, buy a T-shirt. Click on a banner. There's more ways than one to support the radio station. The fastest and best way is to leave a dollar or two or a hundred. But if you want a T-shirt, grab a T-shirt. If you want to look at the archives and old shows, contact Nighthawk, and he'll get you hooked up with the archive access. There's nothing you can't do here. The only thing you can't do is leave without doing something. Right on. Freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. Join us in the chat room. Thanks for listening. Are they going to be able to get somebody up here? Well, we're coming up for you. Well, there's no one here yet, and the floor is completely engulfed. We're on the floor, and we can't breathe. Okay. And it's very, very, very night collision course it is a great show if you're just getting here well you missed half of the best show ever but we still have another half a show to go we have with us tonight astronomer ian musgrave straight from australia 
We have Richard C. Hoagland straight from his phone. I don't know where he is. We have me, Francis Walsh. I'm in Texas. We have MV Life 904 and Energy Supply 2008. I want to thank Richard because I know, Richard, we've been chatting in the Skype chat, and you can't see the chat, but we've all been saying thank you to you as well. So there's one more thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now, uh, MV was talking about how he was dealing with Terrell and, and what got him to this point. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Energy, and Energy is going to talk a little bit about the alignments. Energy, are you there? Energy's not there. Okay, so MV, are you there, MV? Hey, don't forget about Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot. Well, I, she said that she wanted me to hear. She she wanted to hear some more about what we were talking about. I keep on going to Energy, and he's not there. Hey, Energy. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I can Energy. hear fine. Can you hear me? This is okay, Energy. Yes, yes, I can. I can hear you. I'm sorry. Listen, I'm going to go. This is your time. Uh, we talked earlier in the week about some of the alignments that were going on, and you spent some time looking at the alignments, thinking about the alignments and what they mean to you and what they probably mean to us at the same time. Can you give us the lowdown? Sure. You know, Terrell has claimed that uh, when Ellen is at its closest point to the sun, uh, which happened on September 11th, uh, that it's going to rip a hole in the equator of the sun and, and dump out plasma onto the ecliptic plane where the uh, planets reside. And, uh, you know, I don't agree with his science at all. Um, I need to set the stage a little bit before I get into the alignments. Is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Set, set a, set a two-minute stage and then play for four, five, six minutes. Okay. You know, so Terrell predicts that uh, this will cause temperatures on Earth to soar to 200 to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and that we need to be into uh, sealed caverns, you know, deep underground to, sur to survive this. Uh, he claims that the electric grid is going to go down because of the solar storms, but I want to remind people that these solar storms should be happening as we speak, and they're not happening. Um, you know, Terrell is very fond of talking about the Menser Amr Bosich paper uh, titled Astronomical Alignments as the Cause of Magnitude M6 Plus Seismicity. Uh, that paper lists 84 dates in 2010 when fairly large earthquakes uh, occurred and the alignments that were associated with those earthquakes. Um, of the 84 alignments, they all involved Earth. Uh, 60 of the 80 of 84 occurred uh, on alignments involving either planets, the sun, and the moon with Earth. Uh, nine of the 84 were on similar alignments, but uh, with a secondary alignment listed as Elenin, Earth, Sun, for instance. Uh, I went through all of these nine, one by one, and found that in every case, additional planetary alignments uh, were there that Amr Basic failed to list. Uh, 15 of the 84 were listed as only Elenin alignments with no planetary sun or moon alignments with Earth at all. I also looked at those one by one and found that Amr Basic failed to list the planet, sun, and moon alignments with Earth. So, you know, what I'm saying is, is that Terrell quotes from this Amr Basic paper uh, to support his theory that Elenin is a brown dwarf and is going to cause earthquakes and mass destruction of all kinds on this Earth. Um, it seems to me that the Amr Basic paper is, is trying to make the reader believe that LNN can cause earthquakes. Uh, you know, for what reason, I don't really know, but uh, it certainly has convinced Terrell. And, uh, you know, so we have Terrell, you know, a bricklayer who is now an amateur scientist, I guess. Um, well, I, was, I, was, I wasn't an amateur astronomer before it all started, too. So, I mean, I guess we can't start there. We can only end up where the opinions follow. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll just stick to the science instead of the personal attacks. Um, so I've confronted Terrell with this information a half a dozen times. Uh, you know, each time he claims uh, that you only have to pay attention to two of the 84 data points in that paper, uh, you know, throwing away the other points. I mean, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So, uh, you know, he makes a big deal about the 8.8 .8 chili quake resulting in the Earth axis shift that shortened the day by just a little over a millionth of a second and the Japan quake, which was also just a little over a millionth of a second. You know, I, I don't view those as big, as big deals, you know. I mean, it's not a brown dwarf causing these earthquakes. It could very possibly be these planetary alignments. And, um, you know, so, I mean, in regards to the quake, I mean, a 9.0 earthquake, you know, that unleashes 480 megatons of energy. I mean, that's 36 times the Hiroshima bomb, you know. So the Amr Bosch paper says... Um, 
that as an alignment nears, mechanical foreshocks occur normally in a matter of days or weeks prior to the main shock, followed by mechanical aftershocks as the alignments fade out. So, you know, when I look at the 8.8 .8 Chile quake on February 27, 2010, the Amish Bosch paper says that the alignments were Ellen and Earth's Sun and uh, Earth, Sun, Jupiter. But the Amber Bossage paper, I, I, I used uh, some, some uh, alignment lists and some planetary software, and I found that the Amber Bossage paper missed the alignments of uh, uh, Saturn, Earth, Sun, Venus, and Earth, Sun, Venus on those dates. Um, and I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Does, the, does the paper me. ever does the paper ever make a designation of what it takes to have an alignment in the first place? Uh, yes, it does. Um, I don't really have it off the top of my head at the moment. Um, I was just, I was curious because I know, I know that there was never an equator to equator alignment. So at that, I mean, I really, and then if we don't have an equator to equator alignment, we have some sort of pyramid shape. And then if there was any energy transference from one to the next, it would come out at the peak, which would be the comet. So I really, I, I, I've never believed that paper and, and yes, I know that some people held on to that paper and showed it as proof to try to claim that Comet Ellen was doing more damage than we thought, but you know, I never really believed it. And, and I said it because the paper never tells us mass and never talks about you know, how much dense, how dense it is, how much gravity it has. So I just think that that paper is missing so much uh, pertinent information that it turns into a bunch of Swiss cheese when you look at it. Well, I think it may present evidence that planetary alignments can cause quakes, but then he decides to throw Ellen into the equation, which, you know, I think totally discredits the rest of his work, you know. I mean, like on the Japan quake, I mean, you know, he he says that uh, uh, the align alignments were Ellen and Earth, Sun, and Earth, Mercury, Uranus, but he missed Saturn, Earth, Sun, Jupiter, and Earth, Sun, Mars. So... In my opinion, the Amber Boston's paper, uh, you know, which Terrell is so fond of talking about, it, it's a fraud. It's designed to make the reader believe that Ellen can cause earthquakes. You know, I want to, I want to ask something, Richard. Do alignments have an importance with the tetrahedron? So uh, what I'm saying is not is the tetrahedron causing earthquakes, but is if Comma Ellen is inside of it something else? Is there alignments, planetary alignments, and alignments with the object that would be relevant, either or uh, introducing different realms of existence? Is that potential? Okay, so I'm not sure if Richard, Richard heard me. Um, and now I think Ian cut off. So, energy. Um, you've been researching these alignments for a long time. When did it finally pull Can you, you hear me? Yes, I can. Richard, can you hear me? Yeah, I heard your entire question. Let me try to give you a 30-second overview of the science. Unlike a lot of people who talk in this realm, we've actually tried to do some real science. Um, I was very, it was very gracious of NBC last year to send me and Robin Falkov to Central America and Mexico so we could actually measure the cosmic cycles in the torsion field model using this Accutron watch detector that I put together from software and hardware that I've been breadboarding over the last several years. Richard, earlier than that, earlier I don't understand. That, I don't understand again? torsion. I don't understand the torsion fields. Can you give me a minute on a torsion field to make me understand okay. it? All right. In some very fundamental, up until now, classified physics research on both sides of the Iron Curtain, going back to World War II, the Russians and the U.S. government have secretly been looking at a field of physics called torsion field physics. Torsion comes from the word that means twisting or rotation, like torque. Anybody who runs hot rods knows what torque is. So, a torsion field is a rotating wave in the ether, in the underlying substratum of space-time, to bring in an Einstein term. It's really the classic ether that Maxwell tried to give us a couple hundred years ago, but it's not electromagnetic. It's a field under which electromagnetism and other fields kind of come forth. So what I've done is to create a, a technology, 
a, an actual measurement system that can measure the effect of a changing torsion field on the inertia of a rotating or vibrating object. And I use a tuning fork in an off-the-shelf Accutron watch hooked into a computer system that allows me to monitor frequency so I can then take this anywhere in the world and I can measure either natural astronomical alignments of that particular location or I can measure the amplified torsion field changes due to a local ancient monument or ancient site like uh, the pyramids of Teotihuacan, the right. pyramids of Tikal, Stonehenge, um, uh, Avebury Circle. We just came back from England and did a bunch of measurements in the field in England of these ancient monuments, and we get stunning, amazing, consistent readings. Back right, in 2003, Richard. 2004, when the Venus occultation or Venus transit of the sun took place, I took the Accutron system and I went to a place called Coral Castle in southern Florida, which was built by a guy from uh, uh, Finland. I'm not sorry, I'm not, not, not Finland. Uh, somewhere in the in the Middle East, um, um, Latvia. Latvia. I'm sorry. Um, who had come to this country in the 20s and 30s and had built this monument all by himself with no outside help, and everybody was wondering how he did it. He claimed he was using the same physics as the Egyptians used in building the pyramids in Egypt. Well, because of money and time and all that, we wound up going to Coral Castle, and I measured several astronomical alignments using the torsion system based on the Accutron and got remarkable, wonderful, consistent readings. So we have actual readings that show the planetary alignments change the torsion field of the Earth. Now, the next question is, can those changes be big enough to trigger an earthquake? Well, possibly. I won't say absolutely because I haven't been in an earthquake when this all happened, but I know the alignments can change the field, and the field in turn we know in the model can affect earthquakes. Can elanine by itself affect earthquakes? No. Its mass, its spin, its angular momentum, all the parameters we see are totally incapable of producing any changes. And I've been looking with torsion field measurements for the last couple of months, and I've seen nothing on the alanine alignments that would indicate that alanine by itself is capable of actually changing the torsion field of the Earth. But uh, you, you would, you would, can I stop, can I stop you? I'm sorry, can I stop you for a second? But well, that to a final thought. Okay, final thought. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Given, given what our numbers say about the artificiality of l &E, remember, when you're dealing with an artificial system, it can change at any moment. Someone or some robot or some computer on board can put, turn on a generator and make l &E capable of producing the same torsion effects that a planet would do would be thousands of times bigger. Is that likely? I don't know. I find all the fear porn being spread over the alanine alignments very interesting politically, almost as if someone is trying to get us not to consider the positive positive effects of an alanine alignment, only looking at negative effects, trying to, shall we say, uh, poison the uh, jury, so to speak. So I think the jury is still out over whether alanine can change the field, but I certainly think the jury is in that it's not causing earthquakes at all. Okay. Do you have the opinion that through a torsion field, it would be easier for someone to travel great distances in space? Yes. It's, okay. it's the secret of anti-gravity, warp drive, the whole nine yards. Are, 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 is a torsion field actually bending space-time to where if you twist it tight enough, it'll touch two different points of space-time? Yes. Okay. That's kind of what that, that was kind of what I wanted to know most, and thank you for that answer. Miss Carey, are you there? Yes, I am. You've Hi, been Carrie. listening. Hi there. <laughs> you've, been, you, you've been listening to us you know, talk about what we're talking about, which is astronomy, which is common element, which is things like torsion fields and people's opinions. Right. Can you, can you, because you and I have never talked, so I really have no idea what you're going to say, but what would you say is the most important thing you could say about this discussion? Uh, well, I think it's a very good discussion, but let me, let me say right from the get-go that I agree with Richard Hoagland in terms of that Comet Elenin is not causing, 
the earthquakes. Now, what is causing the earthquakes and whether or not they're being augmented? So far, I have not heard anything uh, to that effect addressed. And, of course, we deal with whistleblower testimony, and our whistleblower testimony gives us evidence in terms of witness testimony that there is augmentation going on, that the powers that be know when these earthquakes are set to occur, and they are therefore then augmenting them, hyping them up uh, purposely. And uh, there, are, there are alignments indeed. And if you listen to our Elenin uh, video conference that we did with Richard Hoagland not very long ago, about a month or two, uh, you will hear Keith Hunter talk about the alignments in what I consider to be a much more intelligent way than that paper that you're referring to whose, whose name I can't pronounce. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and I will say that, you know, that I agree with Richard's uh, behind the scenes, you also have the torsion, uh, hyperdimensional physics aspect. But there are alignments to do with the sun, the ley lines on the planet, and, and so on. And uh, Keith Hunter has written a book called, uh, I believe it's The Age of Lost, of of higher knowledge or something like that. I haven't got it in front of me. Um, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. It does outline the science behind the theory that the powers that be actually build their military bases, uh, including around the world. So we're talking Pine Gap. We're talking uh, the, uh, the Negev Desert, where Israel has a, has a, a very important base that also ha is probably got um, its location, does what Pete Hunter says, which is open a stargate, a natural portal in that area, which involves what Richard's talking about, which is hyperdimensional physics, torsion, etc. So what Keith says is, based on what he, the in, in, investigation he has done, there's no doubt that the powers that be could actually use a computer and know exactly when and where different earthquakes are going to occur. And with that prior knowledge, they can therefore either um, augment them or not. And so, um, and then of course we have, you know, Dutch sense and you know the, the, the proof is now out there. I just had a Canadian geologist write to me. It's on my blog on projectcamelot.org. If you go to my blog, you'll see him delineating step by step why the recent earthquake in Vancouver was, again, dumbed down when it got to us in terms of what the magnitude really is. And well, they've, been, they've been doing that with all sorts of things, even the earthquakes. We don't use the Richter scale anymore. We use the, we use the uh, momentum magnitude scale. And I don't think uh, but 25% of the people realize that's what occurred already. Right. So, so what I'm saying here, though, is, is this is proof that they're, if they can augment something up or increase it, they can decrease it. They can also, they can also lie about, about the, the numbers, in essence. And, and so you get even what, what is, in essence, fallout, that it, you know, nuclear fallout that we get from Fukushima, where uh, readings are being taken that are also misleading, because because instruments can be mm -hmm. hit by a scalar weapon and, and therefore changed. So, Aaron, um, can I so we have a lot for a minute. Yes. I'm very intrigued, Francis, everyone online, Carrie, that Ob Barack Obama, the President of the United States, is going to be in a bunker somewhere under Denver, under the Denver airport on the 27th of September, which is one day after the LNE alignment with the sun and the earth. Now, in torsion field theory, there is a time lag between the expression of this energy and an effect. We don't yet know what the time lag is. It's probably dependent on the amount of energy. It's probably dependent on frequencies, a whole bunch of things that we can't measure very accurately yet. But the idea that Obama is going to be in a, in a dumb, in a deep underground bunker under Denver on the day after the alignment with Elanine, I find very intriguing, if only as a reading on what the powers that be inside may be expecting in the way of a worst-case scenario, meaning they're believing their own fear porn. 
Well, I, you know, it, that, that one point also just goes hand in hand with the fact that they just released all the new exoplanets they found that they just had a, NASA just had on their website yesterday, you know, releasing the Kepler information about the one planet and two stars. So I don't, per, I know about it, but it doesn't particularly hold a red flag out to me. And, and because so far they, you know, people have been saying something's going to happen. Something's going to happen, and to be honest with you, from my personal viewpoint, nothing has happened good enough to make me think that this event is something that's going to be the signal that something's coming. I okay. honestly, I do have information in that regard if you want to hear it. Well, I'm just going to finish this one thought, and then I'm going to, uh, what I want to do is, because Ian Musgrave has been holding on a long time, and I'm going to give him one more opportunity to talk, but I'm going to say this point, that I've almost gotten to the point that with all the information plus disinformation plus half information, I almost wonder if they're continually putting out this disinformation to keep our minds off our job we lost in the bank account and whatever. I'm almost to that point because everything that everyone said has not really panned out to me. Now, yes, we're having big earthquakes. Uh, the weather changes have been bad. But, you know, some of this stuff, Obama's going to be in a bunker. It's almost laughable to me, and I'm sorry to say that. But... Before before I go anywhere else, Ian, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Thank you very much. You've been sitting patiently listening to us talk about a lot of different things other than what you and I what you and I might talk about together one on one, which would be more more astronomy. Um, before I say be, before I release you. If you want to go, I want to ask you: Is there anything you heard here that is just went way over the top that you, from your personal viewpoint, because this show is about all viewpoints, and so I don't, I don't want to hold back anyone who says, okay, that's just, that's just not right. So, and I don't think that you're going to say that, but I'm just wondering, when you try to wrap your head around everything that we, you just heard, you know, wh when does it get back to the comet, and when does it get back to, to some real science, which is what's on the, uh, in the images, and who is the smart person who's going to interpret the images correctly? Well, uh, in the astronomical community, so it goes for your last point first. In the astronomical community, it's all of us. We're all working together, uh, looking at images, um, trying to work out what's going on, putting things together. Uh, for example, in the Stereo Hopes group, there's a bunch of us that uh, share information, trying to make sure we understand what's going on. Uh, I'd like to point out that it's re really easy to get uh, confused and uh, about things. Uh, it's often called, been said that science is organised common sense. And that's not entirely true because virtually everything we do in science is not about common sense. And we've spent a lot of time trying to work out ways to understand the natural world uh, when it can fool us. We're, we're, we're very good at being fooled by data. Now let, let's take the earthquakes for example. Um, if you go back and, and look at the patterns of earthquakes for uh, about 10 years, it, it's actually just random. The, the, the earthquakes, except for the, the bunch that occur after a really big earthquake, because of course you get aftershocks, uh, earthquake um, formation is, is basically random. Uh, and if you, uh, now, if you t uh, take a whole bunch of astronomical alignments and you stick them on top of the earthquake, naturally enough, you're going to get uh, times when it looks like the, uh, an earthquake and an alignment are very close together. But if you go through this and do the statistics, you find that what you're seeing is exactly what you would expect if it was just a random association. Uh, I'd also just briefly, I'd like to have a question about the, uh, the supposed alignment uh, on the 23rd or the 22nd. Uh, according to my uh, software, the uh, Ellen will be something like, just give me, let me redo that again. Ellen will be something like eight degrees from the sun, and it will not be uh, actually aligned with Earth. Now, uh, now, well, this came up with the uh, uh, Obama uh, uh, issue where uh, uh, we're looking at um, saying what, what, what was it? Hang on, hang on. Francis, Hello? I think okay. the actual... Can you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you see me? Can you hear me? Hello? 
Ian, I can hear you. This is all good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everything you okay. I, my software did something strange for a moment. Uh, okay. So um, we're talking about what, what constitutes an alignment now, uh, and a lot of those in that paper, a lot of the alignments the comet was within about 10 degrees of the sun. Now that is something like 20 full moon distances away from the sun. It's a huge piece of territory, uh, and. Uh, so when you're talking about uh, alignments, a lot of these things where we say there's an alignment, there's some uh, big difference uh, uh, between where something is and uh, where, where you would draw a line between Earth and the Sun. So you've got to be uh, uh, thinking very carefully about that now. So for example, with the, 20, the alignment that's on the 23rd, 22nd, um, we're talking about a distance of, uh, of, of, of uh, roughly 8 degrees. Uh, where oh, Ellen is actually very close to Venus, so, um, but it, it's still uh, it's still something like six six uh, sixteen full moon diameters away from the sun. So if you want to say that's an alignment, it's a quite a uh, quite a sloppy alignment. Hang on, I've got. I've got All right, are we losing everybody? This is Nighthawk. Francis, uh, Richard, Carrie, is everybody there? I'm getting dead air like crazy. I'm here. I'm okay. here. Okay. I'm, I'm here. here. I'm here. All right. I'm there. here. I think we only yeah, have one. There yeah, is. I want to try to ask that question again. Ian, do you know anything about the Virgo alignments that begin starting September 29th? Um, what's, uh, what is uh, aligning with what? Sorry? Well, we have no. There's just a particular alignment on September 29th. The moon will be at Virgo's feet. The sun will be on her back. Comma Elenin will be at her head, and she will give birth to Venus on October 4th. I just wanted to know if you had. You would probably recognize the question when it was asked, and it has something to do with Revelations 12. Okay, just uh, all right. Give me a second. Uh... Okay, well, we're going to move on because that's kind of, that was kind of an offhanded question. Um, yeah. Carrie, are you there? Okay, Richard, yeah, are you there? I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, I was muted. Okay. Go ahead. That's okay. Now, I know that I, I did kind of cut you off. So if you wanted to, now, and I wanted to make sure that, because Ian had been listening for a long time, and I wanted to get him involved. Um, if you, and people in the chat room said they want to hear from you, so... Let's hear some more. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, let me say that uh, I have gotten some recent whistleblower testimony. And, you know, I know some people re roll their eyes at this. Um, Richard Hoagland and I have an ongoing sort of discussion about the validity behind whistleblower testimony, and I appreciate well, that. What I say to you is it's got to be calibrated. I don't say we dismiss it. You have to look at it as a panoply of other information. So I'm exactly. really intrigued. Exactly. To know what you guys have said about this. Okay, so so what I'm saying here, though, is that we've got a number of things going on, and it's really important not to miss some of these things just because you want to follow the science, which I appreciate. Uh, but that some of these whistleblowers have scientific backgrounds. They work on black projects at great risk to themselves. They come forward and try to give us some information. And, uh, in fact, we're going to be next week, and I guess Richard might have already mentioned, but he's going to be speaking at our Awaken Aware 2011 conference in Irvine, California, and so I encourage you to come on down and listen, and if you can't come down, then I encourage you to, to live stream it, which we're going to be doing worldwide. But at any rate, um, whistleblower testimony is absolutely vital, and as we go into these changes, I think you're going to begin to see humanity is a library unto itself, and that means that each and every single one of you is a library. And we are the caretakers of the knowledge. And so within each of our brains, so to speak, uh, hard drives or soft software, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's some vital, vital information and historical data that should not be lost. And older whistleblowers are actually um, 
really part of our heritage and their testimony is vital, as well as experiencers, contactees, et cetera, et cetera, who are dealing with things that have to do with alternate realities, um, going into other dimensions and dealing with beings that are coming to visit us from there, <clears throat> et cetera. So uh, along those lines, let me just say that I've gotten some very, uh, let's say, troubling information about the rest of September, uh, and I understand that maybe it's it's definitely happening after my conference. I know that sounds very <laughs> um, sort of self-serving in a certain way, but uh, the information I've gotten is simply that there is some there is something uh, coming along that makes California rather um, uh, under the gun, so to speak coming up into the end of September and maybe into October and so on. Now, if nothing happens, bravo. I live in California. I have actually, I don't, I haven't moved, and I probably will not do so unless something really um, earth-shaking comes along, and I don't mean um, that to be a pun. But at any rate, um, so I would say that I just want to give some people the heads up. Now, um, it's, I can't name names here, if you can appreciate. One of the whistleblowers is extremely well known. He actually called me and told me to get out of California by the end of the month. Um, now, I, I'm, I don't like for fear porn any more than you do, and I don't believe this necessarily either, but I have to put it out there. It's my responsibility to report what I'm told, not to just simply decide that I know better than anyone else listening what's true and what's not. So I put it out there. That's what Project Camelot does. We report what we find, and then we let you make the decision. Um, there are some alignments. Uh, what is going on in terms of the brown dwarf and in terms of the super wave is very important to, to factor in. And so that's the, the work, in case you aren't familiar, with Paul LaViolette, who we went to Greece to interview, uh, Project Camelot, and you can watch his video. Very excellent information. He is considered by some to be the, uh, the, the Einstein of our era. And he is talking about a super wave that was headed our way from uh, possibly the galactic center. And that this super wave is what, in essence, Richard Hoagland is talking about affecting all the planets in the solar system, including the sun. And so people that do centralize everything that's happening when they focus on the sun are not focusing on, well, what affects the sun? That's a really important question because nothing exists in and of itself by itself. And so, so uh, I could go on for quite some time, so I don't want to Carrie, talk. Carrie, let me make just one correction. Our model and Paul the Violet's model have nothing in common, and I don't have time to go into the differences, but the torsion field model is not connected to Paul's uh, galactic superwave model at all. Okay, fine. Carrie, can I ask you a question? Yes. Biggest threat from space or from Earth? Ah, interesting question. Uh, well, hmm. I, I, I guess. Uh, uh, human I guess, beings. I, 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 yeah. I think that I think the bottom line is that whatever is going on in space, I do believe. You know, Rich uh, David Wilcock talks a lot about the the sort of natural protections that we have in place, some of which we have no idea about. So I do believe that those do exist. I do believe that this human experiment on the planet Earth is not going to be just done away with so quickly. So I do believe that some of our biggest threats do come from within the planet, from the various uh, factions that are fighting among themselves that want to create certain conditions on the planet to actually facilitate uh, continued invasion. I won't say an invasion because it's uh, it's been going on for quite some time of various beings who would like to take over this beautiful blue planet. Um, so when you know it is it is is a multidimensional question simply because in my view humanity does not stop with just the feet on the ground individuals. We are impacted by uh, non by hyperdimensional, <laughs> if you will, entities as well as 
visitors from other planets, et cetera, et cetera. And our heritage is, is, is the, includes all of this, including the Anunnaki and what their agenda might happen to be, who I am told are very much involved in what's going on here to this day. Thank you Francis, for that answer. Can I interrupt? Can well, I interrupt Richard, you? actually, uh, Richard, Richard, what I'm going to do is I have, we have two other people on the table. I'm going to get to right after Larry asks Carrie a question. If you, if you would just give us two minutes, Larry's going to ask her a question. He's been waiting patiently. No problem. Thanks, Larry? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Francis. Um, Carrie, my question is, you know, we know 80 to 85 percent of the stars in our solar system are binary. Do you think our sun is a binary? Yes, absolutely, uh, I do. Uh, Henry Deacon, very in, in the early days of Camelot, if you're not familiar with him, he, he also came forward as Arthur Neumann, who is, that's his real name, did work legitimately in black projects. And he told us in the very beginning that it was a given among the military industrial complex that we were part of a binary star system, that they all know that and that they simply don't talk about it. Um, the other thing is that Andy Lloyd, as I have mentioned n numerous times, and he was part of our LNN conference as well, has done 10 years of research regarding the brown dwarf. And many of the things that he said in his book 10 years ago or so are now being published in the British press from time to time. And I've, I've had those documents on my, on my website, on my blog, as, as those articles came forward. The fact of the matter is, is that he researched the brown dwarf for quite some time. His, his information is, in my view, quite excellent in that regard. However, what's very interesting, and I, I've said this before, but you can't ignore it, he went from investigating the brown dwarf and writing a scientific book, nonfiction, to writing fiction about the Anunnaki. Now, if you want to think that that's a coincidence or an accident, you may go, go right ahead and do so. But I have to tell you that there's something there that needs, you know, that, that has, to, has to be looked at closer. And um, he lives very close to GCHQ in, uh, in the U.K., et cetera, et cetera. Um, he's extremely careful, so, so you must understand that he, he values his life and the lives of his family. Thanks. Uh, but there is something going on there, yes. Right. One, I just want to intervene a little bit there. You're referring to our binary twin as being a brown dwarf star. Uh, with that being said, does it enter our solar system, or is it a binary of a different source that doesn't enter? Because there's multiple binaries. Does it enter our solar system, if it is a brown dwarf at that? Uh, the idea here is that the brown dwarf, yes, is a second sun, does enter our solar system on a trajectory that's often attributed to Nibiru, um, that Nibiru would be a planet rotating around the brown dwarf if it exists and if it is still in existence, um, and that there are several other maybe smaller planets that also circulate around the brown dwarf, and that that mini solar system is what I call it, does come in and 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 come through our solar system at various periods, and this is where you have so, some of the major... Is it the, 36, is it the 3600 year cycle, or when, when is it? When, in yeah, your, in it probably would be that. Uh, I, I've heard it as the 2600 uh, year cycle, but whatever. How many, how many orbitals do you think that brown dwarf it has, if any? I, I, I don't know. You know, I'm not a scientist, and uh, I'm sure Richard Hoagland might be one, able to address that, but... But let me just say that, that it is on its way through. However, there is a great deal of disagreement, even among my whistleblowers. I get completely opposite points of view as to where it is. Not that it exists, but that where it is in re reference to our solar system at this time. And the only thing I can say is that it is probably impacting us, but whether it is truly in the vicinity of Saturn, as some of my whistleblowers are saying, is not clear. I have a whistleblower who is uh, quite uh, been, been trusted by us for, for many years, who, who says that it simply isn't close enough, it's not causing enough havoc to be that close. Is there a when? Can we say, is there, do you have, Carrie, and then I'm going to let Richard, Richard, I'm sorry, um, you're, you are right after this. Carrie, is there a when in your, in your head with your whistleblowers, tell, are your whistleblowers saying, hey, Carrie, here it comes? 
Yes, we have some. I have some uh, that are saying that it is at, again in the vicinity of Saturn and some of whom I trust quite quite a lot. However, there are others that I don't trust that are saying that. And I have to say that, um, for example, Bob Dean said it may be around 20, uh, 2019, 2016, 17, 18, 19, around there. Um, he says that uh, I have another whistleblower who, who agrees with Bob Dean, uh, who, who has had access uh, to, to top secret information for quite some time. Uh, whether it's really that far away, I don't know. Whether it could, um, there could be misinterpretation. You know, in the military industrial complex, even in black projects, they are told certain things. And so I'd like to go back to this idea that Obama is going to be uh, underground in Colorado around the time of the 27th of September. That may be um, an innocent date, etc. Uh, I recently took a trip to Colorado just to do sort of a recon, if you will. And, um, and, and by the way, I interviewed Marshall Vian Summers, uh, very impromptu, had no plans to do so, at his conference that was up in what was, what's called Estes Park in Colorado, up in the, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, I know where that is. It's beautiful up there. Had an excellent interview with him, very interesting uh, contactee, person that is, uh, has, has basically put his life on the line to get information. Whether or not his information is correct is a whole other ballgame, but he certainly warns people uh, very strenuously about giving up our sovereignty of this earth uh, and giving it away to beings that, that are pretending to be our friends, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, a really key thing. However, uh, you know, I, I don't know where, where uh, the brown dwarf is. Personally, I know we are well, getting photographs that are very, very tantalizing and that I may think, be changing that perception as to where it is. I think, what's, I think because, we, because even those who kind of believe that the Biru or the brown dwarf is out there, they're still unable to really put a telescope on it and try to get a picture or give us coordinates that we can go and find it. So I don't mind hearing that people believe there's the object out in the solar system. I'm just going to go and hold off on believing that until I personally get a little bit more proof. And honestly, I don't even know if a whistleblower could tell me it's out there to make me believe it, but that's just me. Mm. Now, Richard, Richard, you've been holding on and been quiet for a long time. I thank you, sir. You wanted to say something. Well, let me say a couple of things. This is an example of why you can't trust whistleblowers unless you have other data. Just common sense. Come on, folks, just use common sense. In the 1930s, Clyde Tombo found Pluto not by seeing it initially, but by using projections, gravitational projections of the movements of other planets in the outer solar system, with Percival Pell being his mentor at the Lowell Observatory, and focusing in on an area of the sky that had millions of star images looking through millions of those images on old-fashioned photographic plates after he froze his tail off, taking them for hours and hours into the wee hours of the, of the morning. And finally, after blinking, because they would compare two images to see if something moved, blinking millions of star images, he found Pluto. But it was really found before he physically saw it on a, on a photograph by means of the gravitational effects it had on the other planets of the solar system. If something as massive as a brown dwarf or Nibiru was within the solar system at Saturn's distance, the planets would be so screwed up, the trajectories, the orbits of the inner solar system so cattywampus that nobody would be able to find anything in the sky based on any computer program from professionals to amateurs. So this is all total hogwash. It's nonsense. Nibiru or the brown dwarf, if it exists, are thousands of astronomical units away from the solar system in probably a near circular orbit that never brings it anywhere close to the planets that we know, which means its effects on their, on their orbits is minuscule, if any, and it only affects long-period comets, which do show some kind of gravitational perturbations to whereby this group of astronomers now have claimed they have found two locations 
because that's how tides work. You have two locations in the sky to look at to see if there's actually something there. The fact that NASA is not releasing the WISE data, this infrared telescope survey, is very telling political proof that A, they found out where this thing is, and B, they don't want to tell us about it because it comes with the concomitant implications that Andy Lloyd has talked about in his novels. All that being said, this has nothing to do with Elanine. Nothing whatsoever to do with Elanine. It's just throwing more spaghetti on the wall and hoping something fruitful will stick. My final point has to do with Obama going down into this underground base under Denver on the 27th. If Elanine is going to have any kind of effect, in our model, it's going to be on consciousness. The generators on board, the same generators that seem to be producing as a side effect, this tetrahedral shield geometry that we see in the, in the solar wind, may in fact be an indication, a side effect of the purpose of Elanine itself, which is to change consciousness via a changing torsion field on Earth at a specific moment. A particularly nice window for that would be an Elanine Sun-Earth alignment with Elanine in the middle. Now, why would the command structure be going underground during that event? Because the worst thing we have to fear on this planet is not an astronomical effect. It's other people running amok, telling the truth, going haywire, shooting up malls, doing very stupid things if their consciousness is overloaded at this particular event. It's very possible that we need to get whistleblowers who will tell us that, the, in fact, the thing that they're fearing most is not a physical event, but a psychological event, and they don't know who to trust when this alignment occurs, and wouldn't that be interesting? Right. That's where it comes down to. Who do you trust? Who are we going to trust? And that is why I personally went out and began paying hard cash American fiat money to pay for telescope time to receive <laughs> images back so that I could have an image in my hand and I could hand it off to a scientist and they could make an interpretation. The only problem is I handed the, I handed the images off to scientists and the only, I mean, I didn't get much return back, though, Richard, you did me a great favor by explaining to me on your Facebook wall the different filters and what your viewpoint of what was going on. I really, I read that, that comment post like ten times, uh, you, don't you know. But, listen, everyone, we're going to take, I think, uh, Hawk, can we play the bump? Can we play the bump right now and we'll do a station break for a couple of minutes because we're going to run long. And yeah, sure. Now I need to go away because I got to get ready for coast. Okay, okay hey, Richard. Hey, oh, hold on real quick. Hey, Richard, this is uh, Nighthawk Stationer. I've talked to you on Facebook a couple times. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for coming on air. I've been listening to you since, I think, about 96 on the Art Bell Show, and I uh, appreciate you uh, uh, joining us here.